Welcome to Brain and Avat. Today we are joined by Justin Garçon, who is at uh, Hunter College and the Graduate Center at CUNY in New York. And uh, he is the author of a forthcoming book called Madness by Design. Uh, Justin, would you like to start with the story? Sure, thanks so much. Um, so one reason I got interested in the topic of madness, uh, mental illness, mental uh, disorder, is because I've had a lot of mental illness in uh, my family. And one thing a lot of people don't know about me is that uh, I spent a lot of my formative years on the insides of mental hospitals, usually visiting uh, family, uh, one point getting hospitalized myself for depression. And the experiences that I had there really, uh, I think, led me to two conclusions. On the one hand, I met a lot of people who I think were diagnosed with mental uh, disorders, but their only real problem in life was uh, that society's ideas of normalcy were just too restrictive. And if society expanded its ideas about normalcy, then most of their problems would have gone away. But on the other hand, uh, I met people who were absolutely in need of the kind of help that modern uh, psychiatry uh, provides. So I, I spent a lot of time with somebody who uh, had psychotic episodes, and sometimes uh, his inner voices were so overpowering uh, that he would just beg me to do anything to, to uh, help him. And I really never encountered that level of uh, psychological distress uh, before and that level of, of uh, helplessness uh, before. But fortunately in that case, we were able to get him to a hospital and get him on the right kind of medications and uh, he was okay. So a lot of my work has been trying to find a kind of middle ground between this biomedical perspective, which says that all mental disorder is really just a medical dysfunction. And on the other hand, this kind of social constructionist perspective, which says that all, all mental disorder is really a kind of social deviance. But both of those seem to be quite negative, right? So it, it sounds like on the social constructivist view, uh, when there's madness involved, it's it's because you're deviating from social norms, which is a bad thing, I guess, implicitly, at least that's the idea. And on the biomedical um, paradigm, it's that there's some sort of dysfunction in the brain or dysfunction chemically, which needs to be fixed with medication. Um, so is there, is there some kind of third option, which is more positive, a more positive view of, of madness? Well, uh, I, I do see that in a sense, when you have this biomedical paradigm that says, okay, madness, when somebody's mad, it means that something inside of them isn't working the way that it's supposed to. It's dysfunctional, it's malfunctioning, it's defective. There's definitely a negative connotation. Okay, something's not right with me. I'm defective uh, somehow. But I think there's a sense in which this kind of social constructionist view, which says, you know, your problem is only that society doesn't uh, accept you, but maybe we can get society to expand its sense of what's normal and then things will go much better. So I think there's something more positive and hopeful. And one nice example of, of that view, or I think that view really works is with the uh, neurodiversity movement. And this is a movement of um, uh, mainly people who are on the autism spectrum. And they're saying, look, we're not, we're not diseased, we, we're not disordered, uh, we're not pathological, we just think somewhat differently uh, than other people do. And a lot of the problems that we're having uh, is because it, we're, we're being uh, stigmatized. And if society would be more open-minded and be more accommodating to our distinctive cognitive styles, you know, our lives would go much better. So I guess that would be one instance in which this kind of social deviance, I hate even to call it social deviance, but where the social deviance model, I think, can be somewhat, you know, positive and, and empowering. So it seems like if we think about someone as deviating from a norm, uh, that could come out in a couple of different ways. So if you're a genius, for example, um, that's statistically abnormal. Very few people are geniuses and you've deviated from the norm, we think, in a positive way. Um, there might be a sense in which uh, 
society judges you in a negative manner because you're deviating from the norm, uh, but that they ought not to. So for example, um, being homosexual was seen as deviant. Um, it still, still is statistically unusual, but it was included in the DSM for a long time and then has subsequently been uh, removed. A lot of the sort of um, moral um, blameworthiness around homosexuality has dissolved in recent years and it's no longer seen as a, a mental dysfunction. Um, but there seem to be cases where it's not it's not so clear whether we're dealing with a requirement on society to change its norms or change the way that it treats people who are deviant and how much of it is a genuine disability. So if you think about something like deafness, for example, um, the traditional view is to say, well, the ordinary way to be born is to have the capacity to hear. Uh, if you lack the capacity to hear, you have a disability or a disorder. Um, and it could be rectified through some kind of uh, treatment, like having a cochlear implant. The other view is to say, no, there is, deafness is just different. Um, and that to get a cochlear implant would be to defy difference. It would be like forcibly converting people from one faith to another. That deafness comes with its own rich cultural practices, its own language, its own way of being. Um, and that if you impose this um, corrective device on people, you're really eradicating something that is not bad, it's just different. Um, and so there's that kind of tension that you can have in these um, disability advocacy movements or these, um, let's say, um, neurodiversity movements where it's a matter of saying, well, there's nothing wrong with it, it's just different. And at some juncture, those things might become implausible. So for example, if it is just different, we think that there's nothing wrong with um, changing the language that you speak or changing your faith, we might think that plucking out your eardrums um, is a deficit, or that if you did it to your children, um, so they could better fit into your deaf community, we think that you have impaired them in a way that was immoral. Um, so I wonder if we can have some kind of assessment for working out what are the kinds of, let's say, mental ranges that we think are either good, bad, um, or worthy of some kind of altering. Well, I think that's a really good uh, point. I think you're raising an issue that's a real point of contention among disability advocates and certainly among in the mad pride community, mad resistance or mad activism community. I think there are people who want to say, to kind of take this extreme point of view and try to say, no, 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 there's nothing inherently disabling about my madness. The only reason I'm experiencing any kind of social disadvantage is because of the stigma, is because society isn't structured in such a way to accommodate my cognitive style. And again, I think when you have something like uh, the neurodiversity movement associated with the autism spectrum, that's very plausible. It's probably uh, even true. But in other cases, that's not going to be that plausible. So in the example that I described of somebody having a psychotic episode where the voices are just so intense, he's literally in, in a form of extreme agony and helplessness. You know, his problems don't first and foremost come about because society isn't accommodating uh, people like him. His problems probably require uh, medication and perhaps even um, hospitalization. So one thing that I do see in, in, again, in this kind of emerging mad pride community is a debate about how far do we want to go in that direction of saying that my madness is not inherently disabling, but it's a result of, you know, the failure of society to accommodate me. I, I agree with you. That's just, that's in some cases, that's simply implausible. It's tempting to say, if I'm somebody who supports mad pride, then I accept this social, uh, this kind of social model of disability. But I think we need to think, we need to think beyond that. So Mark has pointed out that there's certain circumstances where um, madness is a deficit um, and that dysfunction seems to be the right way to describe it, uh, that there's genuine dysfunction here and it's, it's problematic. Um, and you're pointing out that even in uh, these positivistic movements around madness, they are starting to recognize that there's at least some of the time, some cases are problematic forms of dis 
dysfunction and not just difference. But what's quite interesting to me is that it seems like in many cases, it could be both. The very same phenomenon could have both advantages and disadvantages. So a good example is face blindness. Uh, So we've done an episode on this previously because I'm face blind. Basically, it means I can't recognize faces. Um, And there's massive disadvantages to being face blind. Uh, One of them is that it's very hard to recognize people, obviously. Uh, And so if you're in a social context, it's very hard to gather your bearings. And that has knock-on effects for your psyche and the way that you participate in the world. Uh, So for example, face blind people are generally very introverted, uh, very scared of social interactions in big groups where they can't keep track of people's identities, Um, difficult at school, difficult in uniformed environments. Uh, Like if you were to go to the army or go to a school where there's school uniforms or be in a police service or see lots of doctors in in doctor's uniforms or nurses in nurses' uniforms, very hard to know which one is which. Um, So those sort of contexts are very hard for uh, face blind people. And it has, as I said, lots of knock-on effects. But there are also some superpowers that face blind people develop as a result. Uh, One of them is that face blind people are extraordinarily good at recognizing people by other features, features other than their faces. So one of them is their voice. Um, I have this uncanny ability to recognize people's voices in a way that I thought was normal But uh, when I've pointed out to people, oh, that's such and such, when I hear a voice uh, on a radio or in a recording or an audio book, uh, they're quite shocked that I would know that. Um, And to me, it's absolutely obvious that that is who that person is. Another superpower is that I'm extremely good at recognizing facial expressions on people. So I can really tune into their moods very easily in a way which perhaps many other people who are a neurotypical can't do as easily. So it seems like the very same thing that has generated dysfunction, genuine dysfunction, has also generated superpowers, has generated advantages. Yeah, I mean, there's so much I want to say about what you just uh, what you just talked about. You know, there is an idea in the Mad Pride community, sometimes called dangerous gifts. The idea that madness can be a gift, but a dangerous gift. It it gives me, as you said superpowers in some ways, but it can also have these serious uh, disadvantages. And one reason that I'm very uncomfortable with the idea of dysfunction, you know, uh, when we describe the various forms of mental illness as nothing but inner dysfunctions, I think it's sometimes absolutely true that there is, there may be a dysfunction underlying certain forms of uh, mental illness or some kinds of madness may stem from uh, an inner dysfunction, but that language of dysfunction, uh, deficit, disease, pathology can often obscure exactly what you're talking about, namely the way that people with these disorders have managed to compensate and adapt in extremely creative uh, in extremely creative ways. And one of my favorite thinkers that I talk about in the book is Kurt Goldstein, who was writing a lot in the 1930s and 1940s. Uh, and during World War I, uh, he, he was working with a lot of people who had, uh, uh, who had brain injuries from the war and who couldn't do certain things. And he was very much aware of how they couldn't, they were disabled in certain ways because of these brain dysfunctions. But what I love about him and what really fascinated Goldstein wasn't so much, okay, you have these war veterans with dysfunctional brains, but look at these incredible ways that they've managed to compensate and adapt and not be uh, disabled. And In particular, he described this one uh, patient who seemed to have this uh, compulsive need for orderliness in his environment. And so if if there was a piece of paper and a pen and the pen weren't just parallel to the piece of paper, he would meticulously put it back in place and Goldstein would come along and mess up his environment and the patient would put it back. And instead of saying, well, that's so interesting, this guy's brain dysfunction makes him compulsive. Instead, Goldstein said, that's interesting. 
one aspect of his brain dysfunction is that he's inundated with a sense of there being too many possibilities in his environment. And so he deliberately keeps his environment very orderly uh, and very uh, structured so that he's no longer inundated with all of the different affordances that an object uh, has. So, you know, if a person like this, if, if there is like a coffee cup that somebody was using inappropriately, somebody was using as a pencil holder, that just would have set him off because it was an object. There were just too many affordances in his, in his environment. And so the compulsive behavior was actually a creative, adaptive strategy for him to be able to navigate his environment uh, well. And I think that's one thing that when people focus so much on the idea of dysfunction, deficit, they really miss the thing that's, that's so interesting and important to notice. Another great example is Oliver Sacks, who was perhaps the most um, renowned and, and successful neurologist of the 20th century, who himself was face blind. Um, and he had an uncanny ability to empathize, understand, taxonomize, and find possible treatments um, for patients of all sorts of um, neurological disorders. Um, and what was so fascinating about Oliver Sacks is he made this argument for not just when, when he when these patients would find ways to cope with their conditions, he would say, it's not just that they are striving to reach a level of functionality that neurotypic, neurotypical people have, it's that through their striving, they've achieved a unique lifestyle that in many ways is better than it would have been if they didn't have the condition in the first place. Now, that's not true all the time. And he was very clear to point out that a lot of conditions have these horrendous um, impacts on these patients' lives. It's not that you would choose to have the condition, but it's that in the striving to overcome it, you can achieve a, um, a richness in your life that you wouldn't have had otherwise. Well, it's interesting that you bring up um, Oliver Sacks here, because I, I don't know that much about his work, but I know that he... He was one of the people who insisted that Kurt Goldstein's book, The Organism, be reissued, and he wrote a preface to that book. So clearly, he felt a deep, uh, you know, a deep uh, uh, connection to uh, Goldstein's work. And yeah, I think that's exactly what we miss in this kind of dysfunction-centered uh, uh, paradigm. It seems to me much more empowering to say, yes, there is a, there may be a dysfunction inside of you, but what's really cool is this kind of creative accomplishment, this brilliant and insightful way that you've managed to surmount what would otherwise be uh, extremely uh, disabling uh, uh, condition. So there's a sense in which these things can be a plus two, minus two. So depending on the context in which you're in, they're either a burden to bear or they're a big advantage. Um, and so, I mean, one of the, the cases that Malcolm Gladwell writes about um, with dyslexics is he says uh, a third of people that are in prison are dyslexic, but a third of CEOs are dyslexic. So it's either one of these things that just has this catastrophic effect on your life and makes it very hard for you to prosper, or what it does is it's pushes you in a direction where you have to develop these other skills, which could be incredibly useful in other areas. And so one of the cases he has is a guy who's a trial lawyer who really struggled to read. Um, so he wouldn't take any notes. Um, he would have to develop an incredible memory for what people told him. Um, and so if you're in a long trial, uh, you know, on day three, the witness says something and then they contradict themselves on day eight, you can recall that and you can say it to them instantly. And that's an incredible facility that other people would just would never have had to uh, develop because they're taking notes. Um, so depending on the context in which you're in, the thing could become very useful. Um, I mean, it might be something like people who are manic depressive, I think are going to have a very hard time uh, in their personal relationships. So if you're having these periods where you're um, very down in the dumps, uh, or where you're, you know, working till all hours, uh, you know, that you're uh, consumed by this passionate project, that can be a very debilitating thing in terms of keeping up these long-term relationships. 
But when it comes to creative projects, um, might be a massive asset. And so there's a view that a lot of creative geniuses um, created their work during these periods um, of mania. Um, Jason has said to me that there's some artists who might have had a certain kind of face blindness that leads to these distortions on faces. So if you think about um, some of Francis Bacon's characters, these um, he did these beautiful, um, well, beautiful and disturbing um, portraits of, of popes where their faces kind of pull out like this. That seems to come from a neurological condition, um, but you end up creating something that to others is unbelievable. Um, there's another uh, portrait artist who has done these very unusual portraits of people that are kind of pixelated. And that's partly because that's how he personally sees faces. So depending on the context in which you're in, these things are either debilitating or incredibly advantageous. Um, I want to ask you a bit about this idea of madness as a strategy, as you point out, that the there's some way in which you you might go into an abnormal mental state in order to deal with the environment that you're in. Um, so I can imagine a situation where uh, the world really is awful, uh, that you are in a an objectively bad state of affairs. And to cope with that, you delude yourself into believing that things are going much better than they really are. Um, so you are out of touch with reality. You are not perceiving things as they are. But that might be an incredibly good coping mechanism for the situation you find yourself in. You know, you're touching upon a very deep issue here. And in a sense, the issue that you're touching on really gets to the heart of the uh, of the book uh, that I wrote. And maybe I can say a little bit about that. Um, so the, the book attempts to identify two main paradigms in the history of psychiatry or really the history of madness. On the one hand, you have this dysfunction-centered paradigm, and I just call that madness as dysfunction. I see that as being the predominant biomedical paradigm, the paradigm that you see in the DSM, that is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Um, it was certainly a major paradigm, you know, in the uh, in the 19th century in the German uh, imperial psychiatry. People like Wilhelm Griesinger. It was obvious to them that all forms of madness are just brain dysfunctions. Uh, for Kant, uh, absolutely held the view that all forms of madness are just dysfunctions of the various faculties of the mind. And in a sense, you can see that view is tracing all the way back to uh, the Hippocratic physicians who described various forms of madness uh, as really consequences of just the, the um, interrupted flow of air in the airway. So some of the, the Hippocratic physicians would say, well, the different forms of madness come about when different parts of the brain are prevented from getting enough air because of these um, uh, blockages. So that's what I've called the madness as dysfunction uh, paradigm. But I've also tried to trace out, and this is really what the book attempts to do, a very different paradigm for thinking about uh, madness, which I call the madness as strategy paradigm. And in this point of view, the real question that the, that the healer is asking is, what's the purpose of this form of madness? What is its function? What is, its, what is it for? Uh, what is it trying to, to do? What is, what is the mad person trying to do? Or what's the function or purpose or goal of this form of madness? And one of the things, and this connects to what you said about the idea of some forms of madness as uh, coping mechanisms. Some of the thinkers that I was reading about back in uh, to the early 1800s, there was a German physician, uh, Johann Christian August Heinroth. Uh, he wrote this massive textbook on psychiatry. And most of the textbook reads is a pretty ordinary uh, you know, medical uh, treatise. In this form of madness, here's what's gone wrong in the mind. And in this form of madness, here's what's gone wrong in the mind. But then he gets to this one, and it's right near the end of the book. You get about 400 pages in. And he gets to this one form of madness. And he says, but this form of madness comes about when somebody has repeatedly experienced traumatic uh, episodes. And so they create a kind of dream world. They create a kind of delusional 
world in order to buffer themselves from the emotional uh, pain that they're experiencing. And then he says, in the best of cases, nature actually uses this delusional experience to kind of bring this person back to reality. In other words, nature itself has somehow organized it or arranged for this person to have this delusional experience in order to get them back to mental health. And so he really paints a portrait of the, the healer as more like a, a guide, like your role as a healer is to step back and allow nature to take its course and perhaps try to direct it a little bit if it seems to be uh, getting out of hand. And so, yeah, what I'm calling Manus's strategy is, is um, attempt again and again throughout the history of psychiatry to kind of rethink madness as having a purpose, uh, as having some kind of a strategy. One strategy might be, this is a coping mechanism. This is a way of buffering myself from uh, traumatic experiences, but there may be very different ways of thinking about uh, madness is, is embodying a, a kind of uh, strategy. One more way that I'll, I'll mention is uh, a number of the evolutionary psychologists today, there's an evolutionary psychologist named Randolph Ness, and he's been arguing for quite some time that depression, far from being a, a dysfunction or, or a defect or a pathology, actually has an evolved purpose. And I don't know if he's right or not, and some people don't like these kinds of evolutionary accounts of the mind. But I think the, the point of view that he's advocating is, is very, when you look at it from a historical perspective and you look at it from how much this madness as dysfunction paradigm has really dominated our thinking, uh, I think Ness and, and some of the other evolutionary psychologists are doing something very radical. They're saying, you know, let's set aside the dysfunction model. Let's set aside the disease model. This isn't to embrace this, you know, social uh, deviance model of madness, but it's to think about how might madness be serving a positive purpose function in this person's life, and then orienting therapy around that uh, around that idea. So I, I know that the Freudian um, paradigm is often um, attributed to the um, negative biomedical paradigm. In other words, it's it's seen as looking at madness as pathological. But there's some very nice elements to Freudian thought in the sense that they, they give this functional spin on um, certain um, psychological conditions. So one of them, for example, Freud talked about a repetition compulsion. So he said um, there's certain behavior that people repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat, even though it may hurt them. And from the perspective of others, it seems like what they're doing is just mad. It's lunacy. They're just doing the same thing over and over and over again. And Freud said, well, this is actually very common in all our lives. Uh, a good example is people who date the wrong person over and over and over again. Not necessarily the very same person, but perhaps, you know, cookie cutouts of that person over and over and over. And what Freud said about the repetition compulsion, which I think is very interesting, is that the goal of the repetition compu compulsion is mastery. In other words, the goal is to reach a point where you do master the situation and you're able to live with it in a way that's far more functional than if you'd never met one of those bad partners in the first place. Um, so it's re repetition leading to mastery, which seems to have this functional spin. And when you read Freud in that way, it seems like a lot of his views on repression and depression and the ways in which people cope with difficult circumstances um, is about um, the psyche trying to heal itself in a way that uh, is not overwhelming for it. So there's a lot of psychodynamic psychologists today who've taken original Freudian thought and put a more positive spin on it. The other type of example that comes to mind is a fictional example. It's from one of my favorite books called Gormenghast um, by Mervyn Peake. And in, Go in Gormenghast, uh, there's a king of this castle, this faraway castle. And this king is, he's described as deeply melancholic. And he's, he's far too melancholic to really participate in any kind of social interactions. And he spends all his time in his library. And the king is associated with knowledge 
and the exploration of, of intellectual pleasures. And the impression we get is that without the melancholy, he wouldn't really be motivated to do this. And melancholy in the book is associated with intellectual exploration, which is very positive. I'm quite curious to hear more about this evolutionary account of um, depression as having a, a, a function. Well, let me say something about F Freud, because I think you're absolutely right that Freud, as I read him, uh, embodies what I'm calling this madness as strategy uh, paradigm. And one thing I love about him uh, is, is that he's very ready to try to find the underlying purpose, the underlying uh, function. And in fact, there's a couple places in his work where he reprimands his colleagues in psychiatry for only seeing dysfunction where they should see function and purpose. And he, I remember, uh, uh, I don't remember exactly which book it is, but he's talking about delusions. And he's saying, you know, a lot of my uh, colleagues are only able to see dysfunction. And that's a big error. If you can't see purpose and function uh, where it's happening, you're never going to be able to uh, uh, heal, heal these individuals. One of the, one of the, uh, is very early articles, which I like quite a bit. It's called, um, let's see, the neuropsychoses of defense. And this was written in 1894. So very early and before he's even developed a lot of his core, uh, ideas. What he does is he, he says, there are three main forms of madness. Uh, there's the, uh, hysteria, uh, compulsions and delusions. And he says, each form represents a way of dealing with an unwanted idea or a forbidden thought or a traumatic experience. And he goes on in some detail to explain how each of these forms of madness is actually a strategy for dealing with this particular uh, traumatic experience or a forbidden idea or an event that they just don't want to uh, remember. And what's interesting is that uh, the first edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, this is a DSM of 1952, really accepted this kind of Freudian uh, point of view. And if you read it closely, it actually describes the major kinds of mental disorders as strategies for coping with stressors, for inner and outer stressors. And so it divides up all the different mental disorders into uh, the psychotic, the neurotic, and the personality disorders. And it explicitly describes each one as a kind of strategy for dealing with inner and outer stressors. And uh, the way I, I see it, and I'll get back to the point about the evolutionary uh, uh, psychologist, but the way that I read the history of modern American psychiatry is that somewhere in the late 1960s and the early 1970s, the American uh, Psychiatric Association thought, this is bullshit. We don't want to hear any more about this. Mental disorders are simply inner dysfunctions, and that's all there is to say on it. And by the time you get to the DSM-3 of 1980, all that Freudian language is gone. It's not just the Freudian language, though all of this kind of rich teleological language, all of the language that might suggest some kind of a purpose, function, meaning is pretty much obliterated. And you have a statement at the very beginning that says, here's what mental disorders are. Mental disorders always involve some kind of inner dysfunction. So as I see it, what the DSM-3 of 1980 really did was it insisted on this madness as dysfunction paradigm and really tried to replace uh, this madness as strategy paradigm. And that's not to say that I, I like Freud, that I agree with his work, that I agree with the Oedipal complex or the death drive or, or any of that stuff, but I do see something very powerful in this, in his attempt to understand the forms of madness as having their own purposes. And that's where I see some of the evolutionary psychologists, I suppose you might even call them evolutionary psychiatrists, as doing something very profound, very subversive. I think they're trying to recover what I'm calling this madness as strategy paradigm. They're trying to recover something that was very good 
powerful and important in Freud, namely that some of the mental illnesses have purposes, have functions, and they're trying to recast it in this kind of evolutionary um, mold. So you have, as I mentioned, uh, Randolph Ness uh, in his theory that uh, depression is an, is an adaptation. He actually thinks that the purpose of uh, depression is to help us to detach from unrealistic life goals. But there are other theories as well that depression is maybe has some role in uh, navigating competition. Uh, but, but his point of view, it, it's something like this. Well, suppose that I decide I'm going to quit philosophy and become a jazz musician. Never done it before, but I think I'd be pretty good at it. Uh, what's going to happen? Well, I'm just going to have doors slammed in my face repeatedly again and again. And Nesh thinks that if I'm healthy and if everything inside of me is working the way that it should be, then eventually depression is going to sink in. And depression is nature's way of saying, okay, Justin, let's try to detach from this goal. <laughs> and let's try to think about, we're just going to give you a, a, a time a timeout. We're going to give you a time to chill for a little bit and reevaluate your life's goal. The important point, there's no, for Ness, there's no pathology. There's no disease. There's no dysfunction. This is your system working exactly as it was designed by evolution. Uh, to work. And there's one other uh, person whose work I'm, I'm kind of fascinated with. Uh, Vivette Glover uh, does developmental uh, psychology and from this evolutionary um, perspective. And one of her ideas is that some of the anxiety disorders, uh, uh, possibly uh, generalized anxiety disorder, again, it's not a dysfunction, it's not a pathology. Uh, it represents a way of being vigilant to potential stressors in your environment. So suppose somebody has a very stressful early environment. One thing that might happen is that they might develop a very high level of anxiety, even a level that, that would be clinical, that would qualify, say, as generalized anxiety disorder. And her suggestion is that this is an, an evolved uh, purpose. It has an evolved function, and its function is to help to keep the person very vigilant to potential threats. The idea is that if you're very anxious, you're going to be very vigilant. And in some contexts or situations, that's exactly, uh, you know, the right solution for you. And there's one quick thing I want to say. I haven't read this novel that you mentioned, but it sounds fascinating. Uh, but when it comes to melancholy, one of my favorite authors is Robert Burton, who wrote this book back in, I think, 1621 called The Anatomy of Melancholy. And it's like this thousand page, utterly maddening book uh, to read. And I think that the scholars still are dispute whether is this supposed to be science? Is it supposed to be satire? Is it supposed to be medicine? Is it supposed to be religion? Nobody quite knows what genre of literature this book, The Anatomy of Melancholy, uh, falls under. Uh, but he was absolutely of the opinion that melancholy is sent by God as a way of getting you to change your life. So he thinks of melancholy, and again, I don't agree with this, but he thinks of melancholy as a kind of divine punishment for some pattern of, of vice or wrongdoing. But at the same time, it's a punishment that's designed to get you to reflect on your life and kind of change the course of your life in a more, a more for him, a more godly um, manner. So in, in my book, I talk about Burton too, Freud and the evolutionary uh, psychologist, even though they were coming from such different backgrounds, in such totally different metaphysical perspectives. I mean, nothing's that different from the idea that madness is sent to you by God, or for Freud, madness is an attempt uh, to avoid confronting these forbidden wishes while at the same time, uh, you know, secretly fulfilling them to the evolutionary uh, psychologists who are thinking in a more Darwinian way. But it seems to me that all of them, what joins them all together is this willingness to see kind of purpose, strategy, function.
uh, and that it's it's valuable for us today to kind of recover this point of view and use it use it to kind of fight against the predominance of this madness as strategy, uh, madness as dysfunction perspective. Use it as a way of kind of not destroying the madness as dysfunction perspective, but forcing it to make room for another perspective. So let's recover madness as strategy and say, look, madness as dysfunction, is, it's important. And it, some people absolutely true that the, the mental illness, the symptoms that they're experiencing are due to brain dysfunctions, but we have to expand our point of view a little bit. So I think that's the main benefit of what I've been doing is just trying to articulate this this alternate paradigm that's been, I think, somewhat somewhat buried. So I want to ask you about another way in which madness as strategy can manifest itself. So if you think about uh, some social justice movements um, that take the notion that there are, uh, let's say, inherent uh, privileges and burdens that people have, uh, and that there's some kind of hierarchy about a voice in terms of who should be stepping forward in organizations. So whether it's, uh, you know, those of a, a particular racial group, religious group, sexual orientation, you know, those sorts of organizations seem to take a view about people that are mad to say, well, they've been sidelined and disenfranchised, and so they must stand at the front of the queue, um, that their voices need to be heard. Uh, and that comes with certain costs associated with it. So that if you have people that are, um, let's say, hysterical in nature, um, those that are overly sensitive, um, those that are likely to, to have these bouts of rage, um, of emotional outbursts, um, that if they're given those those platforms for political issues, um, it can distort um, what's really going on behind the scenes. Um, so there is some sense in which it can also make it harder to have your uh, your agenda heard if it's distorted by someone who has um, you know an overly sensitive take on reality. And maybe there's some sense in which these people are being exploited as well. So if you have um, a social movement that you want. Um, to be taken seriously by the rest of society. Well, one way to do that is to put these vulnerable people at the front of the line so that people that are genuinely compassionate and empathetic, you know, feel like they should take your movement very seriously because they can see these people sobbing and screaming and crying. Um, and really what they are being used as is pawns in some kind of political game. One of the examples I was thinking about was there's the Democratic Socialists. And there was that um, conference that they held. Um, and there's this person who sort of stands up um, and clearly um, struggles with being in a room with other people. Um, and, uh, you know, they sort of demand that we can't have any, no one must clap because I find the, the sounds very disturbing. Um, someone else stands up and says, the person who demanded that used gendered language and I find that incredibly um, discomforting and I'm, I'm very upset by that. So could everyone please use gender neutral language? And so you just have this constant policing in the room. You're trying to do something. You're a democratic socialist. I assume that what you want to do is, I don't know, redistribute everyone's resources or something. Um, but it just can't get off the ground because you're trying to accommodate all of these you know, weird and wonderful preferences in this room full of all these mad people. Um, mm -hmm. And there's, so there's that sense in which it becomes totally and utterly dysfunctional when you're doing that. And the other sense is it's exploitative. So you put those people on the front lines um, because someone will say, oh, wow, I mean, if I was you know, wailing and screaming and crying like that, there must be some serious issue here. But what you've done is you've taken someone utterly unstable and put them in the limelight and you've gotten this outsized reaction out of them. Um, and really what the movement has done is just exploit someone who's sick um, to get a good you know, case for the press. So it sounds like uh, one of the questions that you're raising is, what happens when people who identify as mad, people say who have been uh, diagnosed with a serious uh, mental disorder, uh, who have been hospitalized, uh, perhaps against their will, drugged, perhaps against their will. What happens when people who identify as mad kind of develop a coalition, develop an advocacy group? And, and that's what I see mad pride or mad resistance or mad activism is it's a advocacy group 
made up of people who identify uh, as mad uh, and demand that society society kind of rethink what it means to be mad. And so in these ways, mad pride is fundamentally different from uh, other advocacy groups like NAMI, uh, the National Alliance for Mental, uh, Mental Illness, which is a, a very, in some ways, a very conservative group. It says, let's try to lessen stigma for people with mental uh, illnesses. Let's try to get more services and resources to people with mental illnesses. As I see it, the Mad Pride movement, which is still a fairly loose knit, uh, you know, ideologically uh, movement, the main idea is I have an absolute right as a mad person to rethink madness outside of this medical paradigm. Uh, I have an absolute right to rethink what it means to be mad and I don't have to accept what medical psychiatry has always told me. I don't have to accept that medical psychiatry has some kind of absolute jurisdiction to, to tell me uh, what madness is. And in fact, a lot of people in, in this movement don't even like using the terms uh, mental illness or mental disorder because it evokes this idea that medical psychiatry has a kind of jurisdiction to define my reality, my identity, uh, my uh, experiences. And, and I think that one thing that's very positive about the Mad Pride movement so far is that it seems to be fairly pluralistic and inclusive. You don't have a lot of these, you know, the kind of problems that you raise when advocacy groups get going, there's a lot of policing. Well, who's a member of our group really and who's not a member? Are you really mad or are you <laughs> not mad? You know, you don't have that kind of boundary policing. Uh, you don't have, I think people genuinely recognize that um, there's a plurality of different viewpoints. Some people in the mad pride movement don't take medication and think that medication is part of the problem. Other people in the Mad Pride movement are totally okay uh, with medication. And so I think that uh, it can be a successful movement, you know, to the extent that it retains, tries to retain this kind of inclusive, pluralistic approach. But yeah, I mean, you're raising questions that I think any kind of advocacy group raises. Who has the right to speak uh, for the mad? You know, who has the right to speak for madness? Uh, as a whole. And, you know, I don't, I don't know the answer to those questions. So we've had a repeat guest on the show, Rebecca Tuval, and she argues that on the traditional view, um, the socially accepted view, the politically accepted view, um, it is sufficient for you to identify as a particular gender for you to be of that gender, but it is not sufficient for you to identify as a particular race for you to be of that race. Now, she's not arguing this view is correct. She's just saying this is the politically correct view and that there's a tension between those two. Uh, when it comes to um, mental illness or disorder, or if one doesn't like those terms, um, madness, which also one might not like, is it sufficient to identify as mad um, for you to be mad? Is it more similar to gender or is it more similar to race where it's insufficient? That's a great point. And let me begin by saying I'm a big fan of uh, Rebecca's work. Uh, I, I think that her work on trans race is hugely important. And I think that people have failed to see some of the subtlety that you're pointing out. And I think she's correct about when somebody claims to be trans race, uh, right, it's not enough that they feel deep down uh, that they have this alternate racial identity, you know, other than the one that they would appear um, to have, but it also has partly to do with whether their claim is going to be accepted by the particular group they're trying to gain entrance into. And it seems to me that madness is a little bit more like race than perhaps like gender. I don't know her view on, on gender, but I, I understand the distinction that you're getting to. Is it enough to be mad that you somehow identify as a mad person 
or must there also be this kind of social uptake of your claim uh, to be mad? When I've I, I've attended some Mad Pride meetings, there's a, a big group uh, called the Icarus Project, which is one of these kind of hubs of of the Mad Pride movement. Um, another is the Hearing Voices uh, Network, which is really about people who hear voices and, and really trying to help them to harness this superpower in a way, you know, trying to help them to harness their superpower in a more positive way. Uh, and I don't attend those meetings and uh, because I don't, I'm not a voice hearer. And so I think it would be inappropriate for me to go to those uh, meetings. And I think that they generally don't. Many of their meetings would, would, they would want to exclude people who don't uh, hear voices. But when I've gone to Icarus Project meetings, I've, I've never had the sense of, okay, man, what are your credentials <laughs> to be here? What right do you have to be here? How many times have you been hospitalized? How many times have you been drugged? You know, there, there's nothing like that. But I do have the sense, and again, as I said, in this emerging movement, I, I don't have the sense that there's a strong boundary policing while well, you're really a mad person or you're just a poser. But I, I, I have the sense that one thing that would be sufficient but it's not necessarily enough that you feel like a mad person because it, it's not really clear to me what, what, it, what it means to feel like a mad person. But I think generally, maybe an unspoken presumption is that in order to be mad, you would have been diagnosed by a psychiatrist as having a serious mental disorder. Uh, you would have been hospitalized uh, voluntarily or, or perhaps involuntarily. So I, I think that the mad pride movement was certainly mainly composed of people who have been diagnosed as having serious mental illnesses and, and who have had some, you know, s substantive experience with mental health services, whether voluntarily or involuntarily. So there's this famous case um, of a group of researchers who checked themselves into a mental asylum, and they were perfectly rational. But because they were in the space, it was assumed that they were mad. So when they were taking notes about what was going on in the, their surroundings, uh, this was seen as indicative of their underlying madness. Um, to the point that they weren't allowed to leave, they had to get external people to tell the Institute, these people are actually researchers and they're not mad and they're, you know, all the behavior is in accordance with the research that they're undertaking. And so there is some interesting way in which the assumptions that we can have about people can not track reality. Um, we can assume that people are mad because of their context. And we could also assume that people are, are sane, even if they really are mad. So Justin, I want to say thank you very much for an absolutely delightful conversation today. I think you've shed some light on a very complex topic. It hasn't driven me mad at all. Well, I want to thank you both uh, so much for inviting me. I really enjoyed uh, talking with you. And uh, may maybe we'll do one of these again in the future. Thank <laughs> you.